Next up, we have uh, Oren Michaels, who is the co-founder and CEO of Mashery. Uh, he's led the team responsible for working on over 100 brands uh, and creating 10,000 apps by 50,000 developers. Uh, he is a leading evangelist for the API movement uh, and will be speaking about how to grow your business through platforms and APIs. So I'd like to welcome on the stage, please, Oren Michaels. Thank you so much, Thomas. It's great to be here. It's a fabulous conference the week and Geraldine have put on. Um, so we're talking about APIs and platforms today. And um, what most of us probably think we're going to be talking about um, exclusively are the kinds of APIs. Thank you. Try this back. Oh, OK, great. I'll try this now. So. Um, one of the things that, that uh, we're talking about today are platforms, and we'll be talking about mobile platforms. And we saw a few pictures here of people getting really excited about uh, their iPads and their, and their new devices and all these fun things that you can run applications on. Uh, but when we talk about APIs and we talk about the concept of, of using building blocks to create a business, it really goes back much further than the concept really of these mobile devices. It goes back to old style business in general. Uh, an example of this would be um, the Sears catalog. Some of you may be familiar with this. It was a, somewhat of an American institution. But there are equivalents over here that have been around for, for decades where a company will, will take the, the output of multiple different partners, people who are creation, creating the, the products, people who are um, printing and shipping the catalogs, people who are providing customer service, all these different building blocks are used to create a customer experience. And when we talk about what we're doing with APIs today, we're really just talking about how different businesses are able to create an, uh, different components to an ultimate customer experience, one that can take place where the customer is, whether it's by mail or it's in a store. Another example of this is the concept of the hotel chain. Uh, if you look at a company like Marriott, Marriott is, it, you think of it as just this big hotel chain, but essentially all Marriott is is a set of APIs. It's a set of underlying services, reservations, finance, real estate, procurement, marketing, and each of these different underlying services is mixed together differently to create a different guest experience. In fact, they take it one step further. They have different chains, different brands within the Marriott chain. And you can think of these as the equivalent of different operating systems. You have the, the Ritz-Carlton OS and the Marriott OS and the Courtyard OS. And each of these OSs is, is a, a different set of underlying services mixed together in different ways. And ultimately, what they do is they're able to create out of these different underlying services different guest experiences, different applications. We call those things hotels. And so in that sense, you can look at this as really a very old idea, which is taking the underlying services that you do best, mixing them with other services that other people do well, and ultimately winding up with a great uh, a customer experience. It also is part of the, the trend of putting your service where your customer is, something that we've been seeing for a long time. So you look at something like someone like American Express. This is the uh, uh, American Express office here in Paris that's uh, over by Opera, where, near where we're staying. And the concept that American Express did from day one is they would go to every major tourist destination, and they'd stick an office right in the center of town where all the tourists go. And that's where you would go and take your traveler's checks back when we used those traveler's checks. And you'd go and take them and turn them into cash and convert your currency and do all these things with American Express that made them, by virtue of being where their customers were, it made them the go-to travel brand for, for millions and millions of, of travelers. And nowadays, American Express is taking their underlying service and they're mixing it with other companies to create new customer experiences. So you can have an American Express card that's issued by a bank called Citi that might even involve your airline 
uh, or involve your airline and Citibank. You can create all these things and mix them together and create customer experiences out of components. So now let's take a look at the sort of the, the internet-y version of this and what we're probably all here to learn about today, which is the concept of web services APIs and what they can do for your company. This whole movement started really back in 2005 with a site called housingmaps.com. And a guy named Paul Rademacher um, found that he was looking for an apartment on Craigslist, which in, in San Francisco is how you find an apartment. And he was getting kind of irritated because every time he looked at an apartment, he then had to go to Google Maps and figure out where it was and stick a little pin there. And he thought, gosh, why can't I just see where all the houses are that I can look at and find the ones that I want in my neighborhood and find an easier way to go back and forth between these two underlying services. So he created a little program called housingmaps.com where he took Craigslist information and he put it on Google Maps and it was really kind of fun and interesting. And in fact, what it says here, it says powered by Craigslist and Google Maps, but it also says in the fine print below that that the site is in no way affiliated with either one. So what happened here is someone took these two sets of information and made them more valuable to, the, to Google and to Craigslist customers and users by putting them together. A third party developer did this out of passion and out of need and ended up making both of these services more useful which was a, a very new thing, and it, it, it spawned a lot of really interesting copycat uh, map mashups. But what, what Paul had to do, which made this even more difficult, is there was no API at the time. Paul actually had to go into the JavaScript code that powered Google Maps and hack, it, hack into it in order to make all these things appear. And when the folks at Google saw that, they did two things. The first thing they did was hire Paul. And the second thing they did was say, we need an API. We need to make this easier in order to make Google Maps more valuable, in order to get people using it. And this was one of the main drivers of the rise of, and success of Google Maps. So what is this API thing that we talk about? A lot of people will use these words here, and we really should dig into it just so that everybody understands where we are. Well, let's take a look at what a web app is, first of all. A web app comp is composed of three main parts. There's data, which is the information you have, things you know, digital assets. Uh, they can be photographs, they can be text, they can be just about anything, but they're information you have, and the geeks call that the data layer. The next part is the things that happen, things that, actions that take place on that data. Put something in your shopping cart, um, check out, all these various things you can do that involve things happening to the data, and the, the geeks call that the logic layer. And the last part, which is the part we're most familiar with, is what's called the presentation layer. It's how you interact with these things. Usually it's www.yourwebsite.com, but it can also be a mobile app. It can be lots of different things. And what happens in most companies is that someone creates a data layer, a logic layer, and a website. And that's pretty much where it stops. Maybe they'll do a mobile app. But the challenge is that there are many, many, many other pl presentation layers that people want to use to interact with these services. There are gaming consoles, there are connected TVs, there are social applications, there are other third-party applications. All these thousands and thousands of opportunities to take these underlying data and logic and extend it and do more things by taking it to where your customers are. It's a really great idea, but the problem is that all of these, uh, these things don't have access to those underlying layers. Typically, in most companies, they're locked out. They're only available internally. So what these companies have to do is they have to remove these locks and make them available, make those back-end services available for new presentation layers. And rather than doing that and just throwing open the back door, what we find that is happening, of course, is that they create this thing called an API. And that API layer is the management layer. It's what actually allows people to set rules and manage and scale the access to these back-end services so that you have a controlled, managed means of creating new presentation layers on top of the same underlying data and logic. And what's important about this is that as we go into the era of mobile apps, and as we go into what, what uh, we in the API world call the post-website era, where a lot of your interactions with your customers are not going to be at www.yourwebsite.com, one of the important things to remember is that a great mobile app is not merely the application that's on your website shrunk down to fit on an iPhone. In fact, that's usually a really lousy mobile app, and when you see people build those, they have one star or two stars, and they generally suck. 
What you really need to do is you need to take a great mobile app and realize that what it does is it grants a particular wish. It does one or two things very well for people in a certain situation, at a certain place, at a certain time. It, you, and as, as such, most companies are not going to have a mobile app or even a mobile app per device. They're going to have multiple ways that people interact depending on what it is they do. A great app grants a wish, and most companies have many different kinds of wishes that need to be granted. If you go back to the hotel chain example, a company like Marriott is going to have to have hundreds of mobile apps. Why? Because you want a different experience on your mobile app when you check into a golf resort in Hawaii than when you check into the Marriott Marquis in Times Square in New York. Different things, different ways of interacting. You'll have different cultures, you'll have different operating systems. Even some of the different device manufacturers are doing special things that will make apps work particularly well on their device. Uh, that with features that might not be available on a different device in the same operating system. So when you look at these different, you know, these are different examples of things people do and the various kind of apps. You know, you look at, at something like a restaurant finding app, you might find a restaurant to dine at just by looking in general restaurants, or you might find one that only has Italian restaurants. You might want to find one that actually, once you're at the restaurant, it just helps you calculate the tip and get out of there and, and charge your friends uh, whatever their share was different things you need to do at different times that are so much easier to do when the experience has been tailor-made to grant that wish. So I'd like to just take a quick look at a few companies that are doing interesting things where they're taking their services and using their services as the underlying means of companies, other companies, in order to be successful. One interesting one is the New York Times. Um, in the New York Times, uh, what they were able to do with um, with uh, uh, Apple, Apple released the iPad and they created this iBooks application to let you read books. Well, Apple is famously secret and they didn't really want to leak any information about this great app they were launching, but they needed to be able to have people have an easy way to find the books to buy. And the easiest way to do that is to give people the bestseller list because most people in America need to be told what it is they're going to like. So when we do that, what they needed to do is get that information and have it up to date whenever they pulled it. Well, happily, the New York Times had an API. They had a means for Apple to register for a key and go get this information in real time. And the New York Times was surprised to find that their service, their information, was baked right into the iBooks app the day it was launched because Apple never asked their permission, which was fine because not only was the New York Times very happy about it, but the New York Times had already preset the rules of engagement, the rules on how this content was allowed to be used. It had to have attribution. It had to have the Times logo. And by using, by using the API and obeying the rules, Apple was able to go get the data they needed when they needed it, and the New York Times was able to have their brand extended to millions of new users. Everybody was very happy with that. Another trend we're seeing a lot is, the t is taking business data and embedding it into applications. This is a, an application called Zabini, which helps you manage your Outlook inbox. Um, and what the company Hoover's, which is a business information company, has been able to do is for Hoover's subscribers, people who have access to that data, you can have that data baked right into your Zabni experience. So when you're sending an email, it will pull up information on the person and the company that you're, that you're emailing to that it's able to pull out of Hoover's. So Zabni and Hoover's are able to, to collaborate on creating a better application that either one of them could create by themselves. Some apps are just done as a means of marketing and, and taking data and just helping to extend brand visibility. The Guardian here in, the U here in Europe, in the UK, has a wonderful app called Guardian Eyewitness. It's very simple. What it does is it pulls in the one beautiful photojournalistic photograph from that day, shows you the photograph, and gives you the tips on how that photo was made. What did the photographer do to make that beautiful image? The whole thing is sponsored by Canon so that the, uh, the Guardian makes money on it. And they're able to take advantage of something the iPad has in terms of high resolution and color and really create an amazing experience. And the, the photos in this are just stunning. And one more example I'd like to share is an example from a company, Best Buy, which is a large electronics retailer in the US. And Best Buy had a problem when, with their e-commerce site because if you went to the e-commerce site and you typed in GPS, you'd get 250 different thumbnails of tiny little pictures of tiny little GPSs and every single one looked alike. And you looked at them and you said, okay, now what do I do? 
was very hard to make a purchase decision. And so what they wanted to do was they wanted to have the same experience that people would have in a store. Well, what would you do in a store? You go to the salesperson, you say, hey, I'm buying a GPS. Well, they'll ask you a bunch of questions. How are you going to use it? Where are you going to use it? How much do you want to spend? And so they, the, what the Best Buy folks did is they provided an underlying set of APIs with product information and catalog information and all this to um, an outside design firm and said, go replicate this experience. And what they were able to do is they were able to create this interesting experience around um, buying a GPS. And uh, what, what you'll see is the ability to actually take these different things, ask a bunch of questions, narrow it down, and end up putting you at the page of the one that was the right thing for you to buy. That's a, a really powerful concept because what Best Buy was able to do is replicate, replicate that store experience, but take this application, use it as a landing page for Google Ads, use it as a, a means on their website, even use it in in-store kiosks so people can help themselves when the, the uh, um, store was particularly busy. And of course, they only included things that were in stock. Why, why direct someone to something that wasn't actually in the store? So in short, what we're talking about here is that every great product, every great customer experience is really a combination of ingredients. How are you going to create a wish-granting experience for your customers and users? How are you going to take your underlying services and expand the distribution of them into a whole range of new places? And, and the answer for a lot of companies these days is the concept of the API, and if you're going to be trying to partner with lots and lots of different companies to get distribution for your product, that's probably the most powerful way that most of the companies here can do it. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time.